Hey everyone, Evan Varsum is here, founder and CEO of Gadgetflow. Today we have Narek from TCF joining this webinar. He's going to be talking all about the successful campaigns that he has been launching with his team for the past few years. And he's going to be revealing a lot of secrets around the pre-launch process, how to, how to get to six figures, how to get to seven figures. He has worked with tens of campaigns the past few years, including one of his own. So Narek, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Our pleasure, our pleasure. So yeah, feel free to introduce yourself. So I'm Narek, I'm the founder and CEO of the crowdfunding formula or TCF. So we are a crowdfunding marketing agency supporting creators to launch six and seven figure campaigns. Great, so how do you, you know, let's start from scratch. Uh, let's start from zero pretty much. How did you get involved with crowdfunding? Yeah, it's pretty much like classics. Uh, so I failed my own campaign, I raised $15 in total. So uh, then we, we, I started to dig deeper to understand like why it doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. uh, and it turned out that, you know, the mobile applications, which was my campaign, totally not working at all in all the crowdfunding platforms. Yeah. So, but at that time I started to, you know, do interviews as creators, what, what you guys, do, you know, you do differently, how you succeed. And I gathered so many information that I published this info in a book and put it on Amazon and it became the number one bestseller in crowdfunding category. Wow. Uh, and, and at that time I haven't done any crowdfunding campaign at all, <laughs> to be honest. So I That's started funny. to receive a lot of inquiries from, uh, from people who are starting their campaigns and asking me questions, how to do this, how to do that, et cetera, et cetera. And I was opening my list of all these interviews and saying, oh, you should do this. Oh, you, you need to try this, et cetera, et cetera. And to my big surprise, one of the campaigns whom I was uh, supporting raised $120,000. So I thought, oh, you know, this is really working. And I started- When was know, that? Big, when was that? What year was that? Uh, uh, the, the name of the campaign was Adapta Lux. Uh -huh. uh, it was a lighting, uh, photography lighting device. Mm -hmm. a very, very cool campaign with a very cool founder. So uh, many, many years ago, like five, five or six years ago or so. Wow. Okay. That's yeah. crazy. Uh, okay. And then, you know, you came up with the idea of TCF, uh, walk us through the whole process. How did that happen? What are you guys, what's your main focus today? Um, and how do you, you know, ended up helping creators? Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, we started to, from consulting, I had a training course, then uh, I started, you know, to uh, put as much information in this training as possible. But then, uh, you know, uh, uh, we said, okay, let's, let's try the manage campaign and let's see what happens if we fully are in charge of all the manage, management process because it's a really hard work and it really requires a lot of time and resources. So we started to manage the campaigns and little by little we started to see that we, we are, you know, uh, getting some kind of uh, uh, good successes. One of our big successes was uh, Volterman campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, and we raised $1 million during the lifetime of the campaign and then ended the campaign ended with $3 million. So uh, after, after that, you know, we started to concentrate heavily on the campaigns uh, to, to raise, uh, you know, six or seven campaign figures. Got it. Okay. So Volterman was your third campaign, right? Um, at that time. On a, on a minute, yeah, it, it was, it was uh, not the third campaign, to be honest, because I had a couple of other smaller campaigns before Walterman. But starting from Walterman, we started to do it more in a more structured way mm -hmm. uh, to, to put some kind of structured resources and methods in the campaign management. And basically starting from Walterman, we started to be involved much more in the, in the whole crowdfunding processes and do it right, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my point is that it took you quite a few campaigns, you know, quite a few lunches to get to seven figures. Even, yeah, even for absolutely. you, you know, the guy yeah, who wrote yeah, yeah, a book absolutely. and became number one on Amazon. That's my point, that it's not an easy <laughs> process. Um, absolutely, great. So, it's very difficult. Yeah, I bet. Um, so when it comes down to crowdfunding, we're going to get, we're going to be talking a lot about the pre-launch phase because it sounds like you guys have mastered that. Um, but before we get into that, do you feel like there's a secret sauce when it comes down to raising six and seven figures? Um, uh, I would say, yes, there is, uh, there is. And, and the secret sauce is the preparation, right? Mm -hmm. 
The secret sauce is the preparation. There is no one um, system, one formula that fits all, to all the campaigns, right? Mm -hmm. Because the campaigns are very specific. And I'll talk a little uh, later about that on what you need to take attention to. But uh, one thing that is common to all the, all the big successes that we had is the preparation. Yeah, mm -hmm. whenever you are preparing right, whenever you are doing your homework, whenever you know who is your audience and what is what your positioning angles are, uh, then everything works pretty well mm -hmm. after the launch. Uh, but in general, every campaign is very specific and you need to understand you know, the strategies uh, and the di differences between the campaigns. Um, and one thing that, that is working for one campaign might absolutely not work for another campaign. Exactly. That's, you nailed it, I think. <laughs> um, so last question, I guess, which is, you know, from the generic side, do you think that creators can, you know, understand or follow the best practices or figure out the secret sauce and do everything on their own? Um, I mean, from my perspective, you know, we've done a few, a few webinars in the past year at Gadgetflow. And what I've been stressing is that, yeah, for sure, most creators can do it on their own, but it comes down to the resources, the amount of time that you want to invest. And then it comes down to percentages, right? So would you agree that um, creators have higher chances of succeeding in raising six to seven figures by working with a company like yours, as an example, uh, compared to doing it on their own, even if they figure out the secret sauce? Um, you know, it's hard to say, to be honest, uh, what is the best way, uh, but uh, I can tell one thing that's definitely they are able to do it, but they, they have to know that it's a, it's a, uh, it will take a lot of time and a lot of resources from them, right? It's yeah. not easy. They need to have a team. That's for sure. That's number one thing that we recommend to everybody who is going to start a campaign on their own. So we're recommending start from the team, right? Mm -hmm. you, you don't know where to start, start from the team, gather your team. This is going to be hard. Some people has to take, in, take charge of the social media. Some people uh, have to be in charge of, you know, uh, advertising, uh, support, sales, influencer marketing, this, 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 design. Uh, so it, it's going to be difficult. And if you have the team, if you have a time, if your team is ready to invest in themselves, which means that they need to get some knowledge, they need to get some experience and expertise by learning from others, then it's possible. But you need to understand, you know, the, the price of it. If you're ready, then uh, definitely, the, yeah, why not? Exactly. So you're, at the end of the day, you're playing with percentages. That's how I see it. Um, all right, yeah. let's, let's jump straight into the freelance process. So do you want to break down like the, the entire freelance process for us, like perhaps in steps so we can start from there? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll try to, you know, um, tell a couple of things that we, we do in here at TCF uh, and how, how do we prepare, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, here's the thing, like uh, in the preparation process, uh, like we pay attention to three main domains, right? So three main areas that we are heavily concentrated and focused on are um, uh, collecting subscribers and nurturing the subscribers in the right way. Uh, create, collecting a database of influencers and PR journalists, mm -hmm. um, and then creating an awesome video. So these three areas and these three domains are our main focus. Uh, so for the subscriber side, what we do <coughs> is that we are we not only collect email subscribers, but we mm -hmm. also try to have different uh, angles and different channels of uh, information to to uh, reach out to those subscribers, right? So. Right. Uh, like, for example, the process will look like this. We are collecting their uh, emails in a simple uh, landing page, and then we would send a, a, a link uh, to join our chatbots, mm -hmm. right? So then we have already, we have two channels to reach out to the same people. Mm -hmm. Then we would send a, a link to join our Facebook group, right? Then we have our third angle. Uh, so when, it, when something doesn't work in the launch process, we have our reserve uh, kind of areas, reserve channels to deliver information to the guys who are interested into learning about this. Uh, That's insane. Uh, the, the product, yeah. That's and, insane. And then others and others. And there are some others as well. Like, so we would, you know, uh, include the, the list into advertising. We'll try to, you know, uh, send them to uh, follow our Facebook page, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So we'll try to, you know, uh, have different angles and, and different channels to the same people uh, to be 
sure that uh, this, this is going to work in the launch process and the information is definitely going to be delivered to them. Right. right. So uh, I think that, that yeah. diversifying all these channels is, sounds like it's key to your success so far. Uh, can, can we expand just a bit in one of these uh, things that you've mentioned? So, you know, on average, let's say if you were to just gather email subscribers, you would get approximately like five to 10% conversion rate, you know, in your first few days. That sounds about right. Um, yeah. So by having an extra channel such as, you know, Facebook Messenger, that doubles the percentage or it's a 20, 30 percent higher based on your experience? Um, uh, you know, it's, um, it's difficult to say, to be honest. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's very relative. Uh, it's very relative um, in terms that um, uh, uh, there are, you know, many creators who put a lot of attention on the size and on the percentages, right. but we rather pay a lot of attention on the quality of the subscribers, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we might not have big lists into the pre-launch uh, campaigns, but those lists has to be like very highly qualified lists and uh this quality pays it pays it off right at the end right. of the day uh, at the end of the day when you have like a really high quality um uh, kind of list and subscribers who are really ready to uh invest and, and back your campaign uh you know you're gonna get like really high percentages right. high high conversion rates it, it might you know reach up to 20 30 percent etc that's fantastic that's i think that this is going to be really valuable um, to whoever is listening and is about to launch a crowdfunding campaign because um, you're, you're innovating in a sense, right? You don't just rely on email subscribers. You try to figure out more ways to reach the same people over and over again and hoping that, you know, instead of just sending an email and hoping that they're going to open it, that it's not going to land to the spam folder. You're just, you know, reaching out through Messenger. You're reaching out through the fan page organically yeah. as well. That's insane. That's so good. That's so and, smart, actually. And, and and I can and I can open up the you know another secret, uh, sure. which works <laughs> which works super well for us. Another channel on how to reach out to your subscribers. If all these things doesn't work, there's a thing that definitely works. So and here's that thing. Uh, we are sending years. them calendar calendar invites. Okay. Subscribers. Yeah. That's crazy. So uh, we are sending calendar invites to the people. And, you know, automatically they are getting messages like 10 minutes before or 30 minutes before the campaign starts that this campaign is starting. Wow. And this works, you know, super well. And with this way, we are like getting a super high percentages on mm -hmm. conversion sites because whatever you do, some people, some, some of your messages, some of your emails will land in the promotion folder. Some yeah. will land in spam folder. Yeah, whatever you do, right? And That's a right. big portion of your subscribers that you're, you know, paying uh, money for uh, are some kind of lost and not reachable. Mm -hmm. And it's a win-win situation if you are able to win to these people, to, to, to reach to these people, right? Because uh, whatever you're doing, you're delivering them information. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's themselves who are deciding whether to back your campaign or not. So you're not right. forcing anything to them. Uh, but if if they expressed an initial interest to uh, you know to learn about your campaign when you're launching, mm -hmm. uh, then you need to find some ways. It's it's your kind of homework to find a way on how to deliver the information to those guys. Yeah, that that's like crazy. Um, that's a great hack, actually. A lot of people are gonna make good use of it. Um, so, all right, let's talk about you know two different scenarios. You want to raise hundred thousand dollars. You want to raise a million dollars. What are some of the core differences when it comes down to the strategy? But also, please feel free to work us through the actual numbers. Like, what kind of an investment are we talking about upfront fees and everything um, from the pre launch phase, right? Like, subscriber wise, how do you get to $1 million raised? How do you get to $100,000 raised? What, what are the core differences? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, you know, there is, uh, there is one big misconception, I would say, uh, when I'm reading all, all, uh, all the articles about crowdfunding and all the suggestions, uh, there is one misconception where people uh, relate a number of subscribers a lot to the, to the success, right? To the number of figures that you ra raise at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is, you know, this is not that uh, true, to be honest, to, uh, to, to relate everything to the subscriber side because there are so many other things that should work for your campaigns. And, uh, you know, in a typical crowdfunding campaigns, when you see it, there is this U-shaped curve, right? 
right. uh, when, when there's this big launch in the beginning and then, you know, big number of funding in the end and mm -hmm. there's nothing in between really. So, yeah. and, and this is why a lot of, a lot of people are relying, uh, are, are relating the success of their campaign to the number of subscribers that they have mm -hmm. and not nurturing and not trying to understand a lot of other strategies that might work for them. If you check out our campaigns at TCF, uh, you will see that uh, almost all of our campaigns, all of our campaigns, we don't have any U-shaped uh, campaigns. All of our campaigns are uh, are like this. There, there are some like spikes sure. and decreases uh, uh, along mm -hmm. the way, uh, but it's, it's even increasing. It's increasing along mm -hmm. the way because we're learning a lot. Uh, we're learning a lot. We're experimenting a lot on what to do, uh, what kind of uh, channels to nurture to, to gather traffic, right? Mm -hmm. So what, what I want to say that uh, then uh, don't concentrate too much on increasing like uh, the number of your subscribers. Got it. At the end of the day, it, uh, it, it all depends on, the, on their quality, as I said. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's not the cost per subscriber that is going you know, to, to, to pay it off, right? Uh, mm -hmm. In some cases, we're not concentrating on the cost per subscribers at all, to be honest. Before we were concentrating, oh, let's have leads which are below $1, oh, let's have uh, leads who are like, you know, uh, 50 cents, etc. Currently, yep. we are only concentrated to get leads who are opening our emails and, and, and have high click rate, right? This, this is our metric. This is what mm -hmm. we are concentrated on. We, uh, we, we had different, uh, different campaigns where uh, in some campaigns, we had like big number of leads, like up to 20,000 or so. Mm -hmm. And we had campaign, like one of our last campaigns, Pico, uh, which uh, we finished um, one week ago, I think, and it mm -hmm. raised $1.5 million. So for Pico, okay. we had uh, 2,000 subscribers. Only two, we wow. started the campaign with two or 3,000 subscribers, really. Uh, and, and we had a like, really strong launch and we kept the momentum and started to increase along the way, right? Got you it. can you know, install this bigger cake extension and, and check out the funding yeah, curve yeah. and you'll see what I'm talking about. So uh, again, don't, uh, and one, uh, you know, um, one uh, thing that you can take into consideration when thinking how many subscribers should I collect, right? Because this is the mm -hmm. number one question everybody asks uh, me personally, like, okay, so is 5,000 enough? Is 10,000 enough? Yeah. Is 1,000 enough? Yeah. So one thing is, is that is important here is that uh, we are relating it to the average ticket price, right? Mm -hmm. If the average ticket price of your product is pretty high, like if you're selling an e-bike and uh, it, it costs like two or three thousand dollars. We had an e-bike which cost four thousand dollars, by the way. Wow. Uh, and and we, we found some ways on how to you know do the marketing. Uh, so the higher your ticket price is, the more mm -hmm. leads you need to collect because uh, people need more time to think and to uh, make this decision of, of baking the project, right? That's right, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. And uh, the lower your ticket price is, like if it's $100, if it's like, you know, uh, $50, etc. you don't mm -hmm. need to collect that many leads, to be honest, because mm -hmm. people are making decisions emotionally and on the spot, on the True. way, they can decide to back the project on the way, and you don't need to collect huge number of leads, start nurturing it, and then you'll, Definitely lose even with with all the tactics that I some 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 amount of your list are you know never hearing uh, 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 that your launch and and then your life. So That's true. Uh, the best strategy in here is that uh, taking into account your average ticket price, and based on that, understand how many leads you will need. Mm -hmm. uh, don't increase it too much if your ticket size is uh, is low. Yeah. Uh, Right and uh, yeah and, and try to get some of chat. Got it. When it comes down though to six figure versus seven figures, what are the core differences? Um, if if a customer comes to you and say, Narek, I want to work with your company. I want to I want to raise a quarter of a million, two hundred fifty thousand dollars, or I want to raise two million dollars. What changes when it comes down to their approach? Is it about scaling everything, or is it you know you you do some things? in a different way. So a thing that will be different for, for a creator is that if, if somebody comes and tells, I want to raise $250,000, we wouldn't take that campaign. <laughs> okay, that's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> because we're only working with the campaigns that have the potential, or at least we see the potential to raise right. more than a million, right? Mm -hmm. we, we are very selective on the, on the campaign side and, and only we're working uh, to raise a, a million dollars because we are 
you know, uh, devoting a really big team to to the campaigns. Yeah. But uh, but but there are definitely differences, right? There are definitely differences. Uh, first of all, at the end of the day, uh, you need to understand whether your product uh, has this potential, has this amount of audience in the crowdfunding industry specifically, right? Uh, there are products who are very niche focused, and mm. you know, uh, even if if you do the the best marketing, even if you you know get the best channels utilized. Uh, you just can't raise, you know, millions of dollars because there are just not that many people around there. Right. Right. That's uh, right. And uh, you know, one thing that differs million-dollar campaigns to, uh, to you know, six-figure campaigns mm-hmm. is that for million-dollar campaigns, uh, you just increase uh, the, uh, the the number of impression and increase mm-hmm. the number of people who learn about your campaign. And if the amount of people is big enough. Like if there's a big audience for your campaign and you are mm-hmm. able to reach to those audiences, uh, then there's a high chance, you know, you're going to uh, cross the $1 million mark and have a really big successful campaign. Got so uh, for, that, for that, you need to, you need to utilize uh, every, every possible channel, every yeah. possible thing, every possible hack, uh, you know, um, do whatever you do to reach out to your customers. I can only imagine. Yeah. Um, is there a formula that you guys are using though when it comes down to the investment that you're making during the pre-launch phase compared to the amount that you're looking to raise um, with this particular campaign? Because you know there's a difference between five million dollars and one million dollars mm-hmm. or eight hundred thousand yep. dollars, right? So right. how do you define? Is there is there some sort of like an equation that you guys have figured out or have been using from someone else? Um, yeah, yeah, the yeah, on average, you know, I can tell a couple of averages and some numbers in here. Yeah. Uh, so on average, it goes down to uh, 10 to 15 percent from the amount that you're raising mm-hmm. uh, on us. On us, it's like that for, for our campaigns. So if you want to raise a million dollars, you need to have a, from 100 to 150 thousand dollars as, as your marketing budget. And that includes yeah. video, Facebook ads and everything, right? Uh, the uh, the breakdown will be like the following. So uh, if if uh, let me bring an example for one one hundred thousand uh, dollar mm-hmm. marketing budget and the uh, for uh, for us we would break down it in the following way. So uh, seventy seventy five percent of it goes to advertising on Google and on Facebook mostly, mm-hmm. right? Because we're getting most of the results from there. Yeah. And then the the other thirty thousand is uh, separated between the influencer marketing, PR, some paid media, etc., mm-hmm. etc. So it's for us, it's like 30, 30 and seventy percent, seventy percent spent on advertising, and and then the thirty percent is spent on very different channels. Like mm-hmm. we're very heavily uh, utilizing the influencer marketing channel. We mm-hmm. have a, a, you know a big partners, and this is. A, uh, I think this is an unutilized channel in crowdfunding mm-hmm. uh, overall. Uh, very few people, uh, you know, try to utilize influencers on their crowdfunding campaigns. And one reason for that is that it's very difficult to measure, uh, to yeah. measure their impact. It right? is. It's, it's very difficult to measure. But if Any hacks for that? Ways, Any hacks for that? Uh, y- yes, of course. Yeah, there, there are hacks for uh, almost everything, to be honest. That's so, uh, you know, one thing that we do with influencer marketing is the following. To get the most out of it, right? Mm. So we're using uh, our links uh, when mm. we are giving these links to influencers, and they they have to share it with their audiences, right? So these links uh, we embed a couple of pixels in there from different social mm. medias, right? Mm. So th- this this is the hack that it's not only the Facebook pixel in there. Yeah. Uh, it's it's Facebook, it's Google, it's Pinterest, mm. it's Snapchat, it might be even pin- Twitter. Yeah. Mm, okay. Uh, so uh, when people click on these links, they are redirected to our campaign page. But meanwhile, all these pixels are fired, and mm-hmm. we are able to retarget this audience in very many different ch- so social media. Right. Wow. So somebody That's might insane. see our ad in Pinterest, uh, and this will be a very hot audience, right? Because otherwise, if you start to uh, you know uh, doing advertising in Pinterest, it uh, it's super difficult, right? It's yeah, very difficult to reach is. out to, to your exact audiences in, in other social media uh, other than Facebook or Google. Mm-hmm. So this way we are able to utilize uh, almost all the social channels that have pixels because we are mm-hmm. able to, 
to get to these people in, in, in different areas. Got it. That's so helpful. So you're using a JavaScript redirect, you're injecting all those pixels with a 301 yep. redirect, and yep. then you can retarget them. That's so smart. Yep. That's so smart. Yep. So in t when it comes down to a kind of a side question, right? Like when it comes down to Kickstarter versus Indiegogo, obviously Indiegogo offers you the pixel option. There are some hacks that you can try on Kickstarter, but it's not 100% functioning, let's just say right now. So I know for a fact that most of your campaigns, if not all of them, have started with a Kickstarter campaign. And then you later on you do an in demand. Have you ever thought about launching first on Indiegogo? Yeah, definitely. We uh, we had uh, we had many many campaigns to be honest, uh, mm -hmm. which were launched on Indiegogo and they exceeded one million dollar. Okay. Uh, so uh, we had a campaign this year, Siga Siga Watches. Uh, this mm -hmm. was launched on Indiegogo, crossed a million. Volterman was an Indiegogo campaign again, right. uh, crossed a million, and we had several campaigns. Uh, we had these fuel e-bikes also launched on Indiegogo, and they also crossed uh, one million. So yeah, at the that. end of the day, at the end of the day, uh, you know, uh, creators should know that uh, platforms are not working on their own, right? They are yeah. just supporting supporting channels, really great channels to be honest, but they are supporting all mm -hmm. all the platforms, both Kickstarter and Indiegogo. I'll speak about a couple of differences now, uh, but all of them have their specificities and they have their audiences, right? Mm -hmm. It also depends a lot on the product. So if you have an e-bike campaign, then Indiegogo has a really, really warm audience for e-bikes. For some mm -hmm. reason, it doesn't work that well on Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got it. So you, how, do you, you how, see how does a creator, though, figure out what you just said? I mean, you're an agency. You're data-oriented. You have a lot of different sources, you know, to actually get these numbers out. But when it comes down to, you know, just a creator who's doing a campaign yeah. on his own, he's not going for tens of millions, he's just going for 60,000 or 80,000. How do they know whether Kickstarter is better or Indiegogo is better for their market? Yeah, so the easiest way is to do research, to check out the campaigns that were launched previously prior to you on Kickstarter and on Indiegogo and check out their success rates, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So if you see many e-bikes on Indiegogo, it means you're, if you're an e-bike, uh, creator yeah. this means your e-bike uh, there's a high chance that it would do better on indiegogo and then if you see some kind of campaigns like pet related products on, on kickstarter then there's a high chance that there's a pet audience which is a very specific audience right on kickstarter yeah. and then it makes sense you know to, to go and launch it uh, launch it there so one thing that is very simple to just go check out the campaigns check out the bigger cake or you know kick track extensions mm -hmm. to see the fundings uh, check out how smooth is the funding is there. This is mm -hmm. this is also one hack that uh, we were recommending. So if you're seeing like many spikes, many increase and decrease, it means that the audience is not that relevant to the product and creators mm -hmm. are, you know, doing some promotions along the way, yeah. trying to, you know, push it, right, to, to get more traffic. But if you see more or less like a, a smooth funding curve, it means that the audience itself is ready to, to, to buy the product. So... Uh, it's a good sign that there is a, a already a good amount of audience in this specific uh, platform. That's great. That's another great hack right there. <laughs> um, all right. So aside from gathering subscribers, um, what's you know what what else are you focusing on? I guess um, you know when it comes down to the freelance process, from the video to PR, and what's the weight as well. Uh, that you're putting on each of those things? Like is PR, for example, let's start with PR. Is PR like mandatory? Is it recommended? And if so, what kind of weights are we talking about and resources? Yeah, so it, it again, it all depends on the resources you have. And mostly I'm thinking about the team, right? Yeah. PR is really very difficult, really. Like this is the, one of the hardest thing, uh, things to utilize correctly in the crowdfunding process. And I know that a lot of people are just, don't pay attention on PR at all yeah. because for PR you would need like three to four people who who are dedicated only to this PR domain. They are gathering very relevant, uh, you know, uh, contact information of journalists and editors, mm -hmm. and then they are starting to pitch, and then they are changing their pitch, trying to do some hacks, trying to do yeah. experiment, use some creativity uh, when reaching to the uh, you know journalists and editors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's really hard. It's it's very hard. You need to you need to have a specific team uh, whose job is you know to to do all this uh, tough job, right? So does it, uh, PR does it worth 
paying a company tens of thousands of dollars for PR? Not, not really, not really. We are not a big fan of paying uh, big amounts to the to the journalists and the articles. Uh, we are mostly utilizing it for free. Uh, and and uh, I can definitely tell you that it works if you do it right. Uh, mm. It's it's the it's probably the hardest thing to do in all these crowdfunding activities, but it yeah. works, right? You are able to reach out to the TechCrunch journalist, to the Verge journalist, to CNET journalist, and uh, they would require a sample, most probably. So yeah. if you have a sample uh, and you are able to send it out to them and they are satisfied with your product, uh, mm -hmm. They know that there's a prototype, so uh, a lot of yeah. you know, bugs are acceptable in here. Uh, mm -hmm. But it is possible to land an article for free in the highest, uh, in the prestigious media out there, like right? mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. in Measurable, in TechCrunch, in The Verge, in, in all kind of media. But you, you have to understand that this is a tough process. This is a research, first of all. You need yeah. to uh, get uh, a different contact information of journalists. You need their LinkedIn. Uh, you need their, uh, you know, email. You need their everything. Right? Yeah. You need to you need to learn a lot from from uh, your audience. You need to understand mm -hmm. who are your relevant journalists and how to pitch them, what they yeah. really look for. And yeah. we do a lot of experiments. Our PR department is one of our most creative uh, departments in the in the team. It has doing to be. a lot of creativity. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, doing a lot of testings on the on the on the email side to to you know to get their attention then on how to convince them etc yeah if someone if a creator wants to you know they have let's just say their own team of two or three people um and they want to try experimenting let's just say uh or experiment i guess reaching out to some journalists reporters and so on how many usually weeks before you go live on kickstarter indiegogo um, you know, you should actually focus on that. Are we talking about a month before, two months before, two days before? What's a good ratio? Here? Yeah. Uh, so typically it works like this uh, on us. Uh, we're starting the research um, a couple of months before, definitely. Uh, we are researching for one or two months to gathering a good amount of contact information. Like I'm speaking about from two to 3,000. Uh, if you have two to three thousand of 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 uh, emails of of some specific niche journalists, then you're good to go to the campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, a week or ten days before starting the campaign, we're starting to reaching them out, sending out the samples to see if they are interested. We're sending them the samples to see, uh, you know, uh, we're trying. Uh, it's good to have some times for them to try it out and see whether they like it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I would say 10 days prior starting the campaign, you need to start nurturing uh, the, the, the list that you have, the yeah. uh, PR list, and, and starting to get into contact with the journalists. Got it. But the, the, but the, peaks, but the peaks, to be honest, starts uh, when, uh, when we're launching the campaign and uh, we are already one week uh, after the yeah. launch, right? Because they want to the see, like, that, they want to see, you know, the kind of traction that this campaign is getting, right? Exactly. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, journalists are also uh, also not experts in everywhere, let's say. Yeah. They are also uh, looking for tractions. They are also looking for crowd effects. They're also looking for how well you're yeah. doing, right? They are also impressed with the numbers that, that, that you are able to raise in the first couple yeah. of days. This is one thing. And then their audiences are also kind of human beings. <laughs> so they are, they are also affected on all these factors. And it's good that if you if you're landing an article on TechCrunch, for example, right? Mm -hmm. It's good that you land this article one week after you start your campaign, than mm -hmm. just exactly in the launch day, because in the launch day your campaign is not that attractive in the exactly. sense that you are not raising that amount of money. Yeah. So yep. we're, we're trying to get into contact with them and trying to in you know enhance our relationship with the journalists. But the the heavy pitch the heavy pitch uh, starts. Uh, after uh, well, after we are already good with the funding, yeah, totally agree. That's that's another smart approach right there. Video production. Are you guys doing anything differently? I've seen campaign spending up to like thirty, forty thousand dollars for just a video. I'm not a big fan of that, to be honest. Uh, you can get this job done with five, ten thousand easily. Um, when it comes down to the approach, though, is it something specific that you guys are focusing on, or it's it, it really depends on the product whether it's yep. going to be a funny video or you know a corporate style video or a commercial style video 
I can share a couple of learnings uh, that we have learned throughout the way. Uh, you know, before uh, a couple of years ago, I would say uh, there are two main factors that you need to consider in the video. It's virality and the product presentation, right? Mm -hmm. Now I'm only focused on the product presentation, to be honest. <laughs> uh, yeah. I put the virality and the humor a little aside. It mm -hmm. is important. It is important to keep people watching until the end of the video. So you need to have some some humoristic approach, you need to have some interactions, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah. the main thing you have to concentrate is the product presentation from the angles re re that resonates a lot with your audiences, Yeah. right? So before you need to do your homework and you need to understand who is your audience and why they gonna back your project. This might seem like very simple questions, but uh, you know, we employ a whole bunch of you know data and processes to come to that uh, questions right it's it's, yeah. it's a really big fight with uh, always with our video production team on positioning <laughs> on on audience on what you need to put first what you need to put second etc but at the end of the day you you need to understand that uh, people who are coming to your uh, campaign page and this is the main page where they see the video mm -hmm. uh, what they want to know is uh, what your product is about and how yep. can they benefit about that right it's not about bringing the, the customers to to your campaign page so this is why it's 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 not that important to have a, like super viral video yeah. i have seen a, a video uh, one of my friends uh, had one video which uh, had uh, 120 million views wow 120 million views i'm not exaggerating at all that's crazy uh, and the campaign and the campaign raised $30,000 what yeah wow so that means that they have a super viral video and the video was super cool. The yeah. video was super cool. And, but, but it was not working. It was not, uh, you know, uh, pinpointing the, the pain points of the audience, right? It's not mm -hmm. uh, showing the benefits. It's, it's raising a lot of questions and it was super, super fun. Everybody was sharing it, uh, but nobody was going to buy uh, with this yeah. type of video. So we, uh, one learning that we, uh, that we have at TCF is that a product presentation is the most important thing and it depends on the product to understand how to present it correctly in the right way uh, you need to make it emotional uh, if yeah. the video is not if there are no emotions uh, you know the video is, is is not working at all so one thing that is still still working and i think it it, it will work forever uh, is that people are buying with their emotions and yes. if you are not able to evoke some kind of emotions when people are watching to your videos uh then they you know they just close it clo close the campaign and uh go find yeah. some other things yeah you know, i agree i agree 100 percent. emotion plays a big role when it comes to video uh and photography as well for sure absolutely um, absolutely yeah social media are you guys a big fan of are you fans i guess uh of uh, yeah. managing like social media accounts i'm not talking about like the page reach and everything i'm talking about the organic aspect because i've seen like if not thousands, definitely hundreds of creators, right? Like trying to take advantage of the organic reach of Instagram and Facebook. So they launch like their own Facebook fun page, let's just say four or five weeks uh, before they go live. And they're just hoping for the best. They're gathering like a couple of likes, few tens of uh, fans and everything. Do you think it's working? Do you think that it's worth the investment in terms of time in this case? Yeah, that's that's a great question, actually. Uh, so um, the thing is the following: it is working, but mm -hmm. again, as everything, you need to understand the basics on on how to utilize that channel, right? Yeah. We are really big fans of of social media, and we are doing a lot of things. I'll tell you uh, now what what we are specifically doing with the social media. Mm -hmm. So uh, starting just a couple of weeks before the campaign is the wrongest approach, of course. Mm -hmm. It is the wrongest approach, and if you just don't have a page. Uh, just uh, don't pay a lot of attention to it because it, it, it won't work, right? Yeah. Uh, you need to start it as early as possible, uh, like at least a couple of months before, at least like three, four mm -hmm. months before, starting to gather your audience, starting to uh, get some people who are into your product. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what we are doing with our social media accounts, we are not only posting, uh, only banners, only only commercial posts, etc. So. Uh, another misconception for many people is that social media is only about posting your photos and then yeah. banners and, and that's it. Uh, yeah. But uh, you can do uh, like a real a lot of things with the social media. Like you need to post, 
You need to create engagements. You need to do some interactive uh, posts. You need to ask questions. You need to educate them. We are posting some infographics. We are posting some viral videos, some life hacks, some educational posts, uh, yeah. some contests. Like for example, one of our campaigns, uh, we had this bristly campaign. It was a dog toothbrush. Yeah, I remember uh, it's that. funny, but you know, dogs, uh, you know, love brushing yeah. their. <laughs> they actually, don't love, but before bristly, but it was a great, uh, great product to help uh, you know dog parents uh, brush teeth of the of their dogs. So yeah. for bristly, what we did with the social media and it worked perfectly was we created a contest where we asked um, uh, dog parents to post their photos with their dogs, and we created this uh, viral hashtag my dog like me. Uh, and it turns out a lot of creators looked like their dogs wow. <laughs> or, or vice versa. <laughs> so uh, a, a lot of parents, sorry. And it, it was very funny. It went viral. We yeah. got uh, in, in a matter of weeks, we got about 40, 50,000 people wow. joining, uh, joining this hashtag. When you search on Instagram or Facebook, I uh, suppose they would be even more now. Uh, yeah. And a lot of influencers. So when we see that this is working, we started to utilize this with the with the influencer marketing and ask our, our uh, partner influencers to share it with their audiences so it take over from there and it became a really viral challenge throughout the campaign and you can imagine how many uh how much traffic we got from there right that's crazy uh, yeah it went viral yeah. so, obviously so it, it it went viral uh one thing that is you know good to understand not only in social media in, in every in yeah. everywhere right you need to put more resources on things that are working Exactly. Right? This this is the key. So try you need to try experimenting a lot. Uh, you need to do a lot of things. And when you see something is working, like when we saw this this challenge is working, we started to put more more resources. We started to promote posts. We started to you know uh, invite influencers to do the uh, influencer posts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We even published a couple of articles, yeah. right? So uh, because we saw that this is working, because we saw there is this virality coefficient among all this. Uh, and we understood, okay, guys, we need to, you know, pay more attention in here. Uh, one thing that is uh, common in here at TCF is that uh, we need to fail a lot. Uh, yeah. and, and we are encouraging. We are, uh, like in, in some companies, people are getting fired for mistakes, for their, yeah. for their failures. In our company, people are fired for not making mistakes. So we have, a, we have, we have even a, a quarterly meetings where we say, okay, you need to have at least 10 big mistakes, 10 big failures. Yeah. If somebody is, is not making, you know, 10 big failures, it means that he's, they're not he's trying. Not they're not trying. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So this, this works in crowdfunding because, uh, you know, even with our experience, we never know what will work for this campaign or that campaign. Yeah. No, I think that applies to everything, to be honest. Now, Eric, fail and fail fast. <laughs> you learn a bunch from it. Cool. That, that has been fantastic. A lot of, a lot of stuff that uh, we've discussed today is going to be very useful to most creators. Anything else specific that you want to share around the pre-launch process? Anything that creators should be aware of? Uh, I know we've talked about pretty much everything today. And, you know, like when it comes down to working on your campaign, uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's recommended to have some sort of like a checklist. If you're not super familiar with the industry, if it's your first campaign, uh, if you're not working with a, a company or an agency or a consultant, definitely make sure that you guys uh, download a checklist. There are hundreds of checklists. There's a gadgetful checklist as, as well out there. Um, but when it comes down to freelance, I think we covered everything today. Don't you agree? Um, yeah, we covered a lot. You know, there are a lot of things, and, I, and I'm trying to, uh, uh, to uh, I'm trying to tell a lot of specifics to to make yeah. as much uh, you know make it as useful as possible because right, I, right, I yeah. Remember myself when I was trying to do crowdfunding, and I couldn't find a lot of resources and a lot of specifics on, on what to do, what buttons to push, what hacks are there, etc. Et and this is why I failed. So uh, we are very open. We are sharing a lot of hacks on our blog, mm -hmm. and every week we are publishing all the hacks that we are finding. So uh, we are pretty open on opening all the secrets. And I have a couple of things on my list as well, which I wanted also to uh, you know to tell maybe they. Sure. That for sure would be useful for for uh, a lot of people if they are if they are serious in uh, and they want to raise you know a lot of funds. So uh, one thing that uh, uh, just a couple of hacks. I, I know we don't have that much time. So one hack um, uh, to uh, 
uh, to Facebook ads, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Facebook ads are one of the, one of the most important channels and there are a lot of ads for Facebook. I'll just try to yep. say just a couple of stuff. So one thing to uh, get your Facebook ads in front of your competitors, in, in, in front of your competitor audiences, mm -hmm. like people who are, imagine people who want to buy a dog product, right? They are, no, they are not only checking your campaign or they are, they are not checking your uh, project. They are going into different campaigns. They're checking what is there. They even might go to Amazon. They go yeah. to, you know, to Shopify, et cetera, et cetera. But they are interested into this category, right? Yeah. So what we are doing, we are creating lookalike audiences from not people who purchased your product, but from people who uh, reach to this add to cart place. Huh. Yeah. Fantastic. So this is a, this is a great hack because uh, with these lookalikes, uh, Facebook understands that this guy who is, you know, going and, and putting it to cut, but, but he's not purchasing yeah. yet. Yeah, so he hasn't purchased yet. He's just putting it to cards and he's just about to purchase. And if you create a, an uh, 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 add to cart audience, a lookalike audience from, from, yeah. from your own audience, you are able to reach out to a bigger audience who are uh, about to do the purchase. It's about the intent. I love that. That's yes. another great yes. hack yes. right there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it works fantastically well. Overall, the lookalike audiences, I, I think, are, are working really well. And another hack is that you need to create as many lookalike audiences as possible. Yeah. And your initial and if you change your initial custom audience, even by small amount, like imagine you have 1,000 uh, bakers and you want to create a lookalike audience out of that. And if, the, the, uh, if you add another one, like if it's 1,001 baker, your lookalike audience might be totally different lookalike audience, right? right? So you need to create as many lookalike audiences as possible and try to nurture right. them. And another thing is that uh, another thing uh, is that this is probably everybody knows that Facebook limits the reach of the banner if the text is uh, more than twenty yep. percent. Everybody knows it, but yep. there is there there is a cool hack on how to overcome it. Right? Oh, I'm, I'm can, all ears. <laughs> yeah, in reality, you can put as many text on your banner as you wish. You can make it like the whole text. Okay. One thing Facebook algorithms take into account is not the amount of text on the banner, but the amount of contrast this mm. text has in the background. So if you have white background and black text, it would block it. But if you have gray background and a little darker gray with your text, it will allow it. Yeah, That's but crazy. It's pretty much visible. You can have, you know, uh, yellow ba yellow banner with the orange text yeah, yeah and you yeah. can put whatever you want in there it, it won't be blocked and so it, it has to look so it has to look like a gradient in a sense that's insane i yeah. hope there's no one from facebook here today listening to yeah. this <laughs> um <laughs> yeah i'm not gonna it's like okay, admit yeah, to this webinar yeah. anyone with an ad facebook yeah, yeah. Or, or, email address yeah, uh, <laughs> whoever whoever is listening to this you need to do it as soon as possible because you know a lot of people yeah. might facebook might learn about this and they'll take this down so use it yeah. as soon as possible guys it sounds like uh, it's, yeah no. it's, it sounds like it's very hard though to take it down because they're obviously using deep learning algorithms when it comes to that and you know it's an automated process it's not like they have someone yeah. reviewing manually the text ads so I think that we should. This should work at least for the next few months, for sure. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. We have another yeah. couple of months for sure. <laughs> yeah. To use all this. <laughs> That's uh, fantastic. Yeah. So, yeah. And another thing is is this thing which is called Facebook liquidity. Mm -hmm. What is this? Is that uh, you need to um, you need to create campaigns, and uh, in the ad set level, you need to uh, put a different ad set in there. Right. This mm -hmm. works fantastically well. So you need to uh, have uh, banners, videos, and carousel type of ads mm -hmm. in there. And Facebook, with this learn, with their learning algorithm, they know uh, whenever show video to some people, whenever to show banner, and when to show uh, carousel ads. Okay. Right. So they they know their audience, and they know the people who are into clicking videos, who are into clicking uh, banners, and who are into mm. clicking carousel ads. And you need to have all this into the one campaign, not create mm -hmm. separate campaign, separate video, separate banner, etc. You need to have it within one campaign and uh, leave it up to Facebook to, to show it, uh, you know, to their audience. And Facebook knows much better than you do. That's uh, and, and yeah, and, and uh, this way you will increase your efficiency by a lot, by really a lot. So basically to summarize, you create a campaign 
let's just say website traffic campaign, whatever. And then inside that campaign, you have three different ad, uh, ad sets. And each ad set is a video, it's a different format basically. One is a video, the other one is just a photo, and the other one is just carousel ad, right? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. One thing that Facebook one thing that Facebook likes is that you don't create that many campaigns, but you mm -hmm. keep everything within one campaign. So you can yeah. create as many ad sets as possible. And you leave it up to Facebook, leave it to their learning algorithm to decide which one to show to whom, right? So after some learning, after your learning is passed, Facebook will know, uh, you know, uh, what you really want and who is really your audience. And mm. they will learn even like whether this audience is into, into videos, into banners, into carousel ads. Uh, yeah. Like That's very great. few people use the use carousel ads and, and they work like, they are one of the uh, best hacks that we use, by the way. They are, they are yeah. one of the cheapest, cheapest, cheapest uh, ways to, to get clicks and, and conversions. That's great. That's fantastic. Are you, you know, one kind of a side question since we're talking about Facebook, and I guess that's the last question for today. Uh, are you more into like mobile targeting, desktop targeting, or both? Both, definitely. We do, we do both. We do both. Uh, they both work. Uh, mobile more than uh, desktop, of course, but the tracking for desktop is better than for mobile. So, of course, uh, especially on Kickstarter, you might see that, you know, uh, you are not receiving conversions from mobile, but it's not the case. It's just uh, just a, a tracking thing. Uh, but definitely, you need to you need to use both. Sometimes you need to leave it up to Facebook to decide yeah. where to show it, right? Um, yeah, that's great. Awesome, Narek. Well, thanks for sharing all these uh, all these valuable hacks and feedback and advice. It's been great having you today. Um, I think that you know if you guys like implement just one out of everything that Narek said today, one of the things, uh, you're gonna have a super successful campaign. Uh, again, Narek, it was great having you, man. Yeah, my pleasure, my pleasure. I, I really wish this was useful and I really wish there was yeah. some implementable things that people will take, use it and get more results. Yeah, I think it was super useful. It was really valuable. And again, thank you for uh, being part of today's webinar. Thank you so my much, pleasure. guys. See you guys on the next one.